uh, here to talk about uh, the, the programs of government on climate change. Um, and uh, I, I removed uh, the word updates because uh, uh, it's, it's primarily, uh, I want, would like to focus primarily on the role of the academic and R&D R &D sector. I also grade the potential, the word potential because uh, it's no longer really something that's potential. It's something that's uh, supposed to be really uh, the role taken by uh, by sectors when we talk about like, climate change. So I hope uh, that this afternoon I can shed light on these issues, uh, specifically on how climate change affects uh, uh, rural development because that is uh, an issue that's close to my heart. And I think that's also something uh, that's uh, in the context of uh, this uh, seminar this afternoon. So, I, I show you this first slide just to illustrate uh, the fact that uh, no matter what you talk about, uh, from the moment you wake up in the morning, or even while, while you're still sleeping, it's always related to climate change. No, no matter what topic uh, we discuss, it will always be related to climate change. Meron nga pong tumawag sa office namin pagkatapos nung lindol eh. Uh, tinatanong sa amin kung gagawin po ng bilhin doon. Hindi po related ang earthquake sa climate change. But uh, a lot of people confuse natural disasters of any kind with climate change. And uh, I think uh, it has come to a point where climate change is always uh, blamed for anything. You know? Kahit po sa anong problema ng tao, climate change yan, may kasalanan. But uh, it is a fact that climate change is now the most cross-cutting policy. Uh, if you look at any of the policy areas out there, it is always tied up with the issue of climate change in, in, in various, various ways. Uh, but most importantly, uh, even the way that uh, financial flows uh, into developing countries, either in the form of aid or climate change financing, they're, they're always uh, tied up with climate change. And, uh, that is uh, what's happening now and that's why a lot of people become more interested in looking at this issue because apparently if you talk with multilateral uh, development uh, institutions or financial institutions, a lot of their portfolio would now be tied up with climate change. Now, before we go to uh, the role of the academic sector, I think it's good to underscore where it all uh, emanates. Uh, the, this, this whole discussion about climate change. Of course, uh, climate change is a biophysical phenomenon happening all over the world, but uh, it, uh, the policy, uh, in the policy arena, it all started uh, with the Climate Change Treaty or the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change that was adopted in 1992 during the Earth Summit. And uh, I, I, I would uh, always uh, start with a discussion of what's happening in, those, in, in that convention because it's supposed to be a legally binding uh, arrangement. It's a treaty, no less. And it's important for countries who are signatories or parties to such a treaty or convention to fulfill their obligations there. And the objective of, uh, I always carry the Bible, of uh, negotiators, which is uh, the, the Climate Change Convention. The ultimate objective of uh, the convention is to stabilize the concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere uh, uh, and also to help to, to ensure that natural and human systems are able to adapt to the changes. Yan po ang twin objectives ng, ng convention. And uh, is that, uh, are those objectives being fulfilled? I'm sure you've uh, heard about Copenhagen, that was 2009. Uh, it was a failure, of course. Uh, I cannot be caught uh, publicly saying that, uh, but uh, it is a failure. I mean, I, we cannot mince words about what happened in Copenhagen. Now, we, we tried to salvage the process in Cancun last December, uh, for those of you who follow things on, uh, on the web or even in the news, uh, this was another high-profile event, but uh, it did save the process because uh, the, 
the trust that was lost in Copenhagen was rebuilt in Mexico, but it was not enough to save the climate. And I'll tell you why. This is this is one of the stunts by by uh, the NGO groups uh, in uh, the uh, beach front of uh, of Cancun. So why did the Cancun fail uh, to save the planet? Well, for one, if you delay action, then you're actually compounding the problem. We know that climate change is a problem that only that, that has a small window of opportunity for us to solve it. Because greenhouse gases in the atmosphere keep on accumulating and if we don't uh, have a global regime to cut down emissions then and if we delay that even by a few months then it's really going to be uh, troublesome. The sense of urgency right now compared to two years ago in solving this problem is so much lower. And uh, that, for me that, 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 that bothers me a lot. Uh, and what you have on the table as pledges, by, mainly by countries who are responsible for, for this problem, is uh, it's very, it's very, uh, very small and the pledges are very, very small and they fall short of what is demanded or required by, by the latest science. And uh, at the end of the day, what uh, can we say about this process? We, it, it's about development, especially of, uh, of, of, of uh, countries that are poor. What you have there as the atmosphere is actually real estate of development. And uh, they practically occupied much of the space in, in, his, in, in, in recent times and in, in the past. And so developing countries like the Philippines would have less space for development. Because what we have in the future is a carbon-constrained world where carbon uh, will be limited or the emission of uh, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere will be limited. So um, the role of uh, institutions for uh, confronting climate change uh, all starts emanates from the convention. And uh, without burdening you, with uh, all of these uh, words, I just wanted to show you that indeed, in this booklet called the Climate Change Convention, there there are provisions that are focused on uh, the promotion uh, of, for example, uh, transfer of technology, promotion of and cooperation in scientific, technological, and technical, socio-economic uh, research, also systematic observation and development of data archives related to, to the whole problem. It also has uh, provisions that aims to promote and cooperate in full, open, and prompt exchange of scientific, technological, technical, socioeconomic, even legal information. So even the Climate Change Convention sets the tone for the roles of institutions, specifically in, per in particular academic institutions, uh, and also research uh, institutions uh, in, uh, in confronting climate change. So you also have uh, as a provision there, these are under Article 4.1. Article 4 is about commitments by parties who are signatories to the convention. It also talks about promotion, cooperation in education, training, and public awareness. So these roles are not things that will be dictated or invented by uh, the national government, but uh, they are enshrined in a global treaty. But how do we actually confront uh, this problem in relation to uh, what is mandated in, in the convention? I, I, I invite you to look at uh, a common visioning exercise. I, I'm sure a lot of you have come across this exercise before, so I'm not going to uh, ask you to spend one minute to solve it, but. Uh, uh, I just wanted to illustrate the importance of thinking outside of the box because we know that the solution to this puzzle is to go beyond the four corners of the puzzle and uh, most people probably would, would fall into the trap of confining themselves within those four dots and uh, the solution obviously uh, falls outside of the box. So when we confront climate change and when we talk about 
roles of institutions when we talk about addressing this problem. We have, it's time for us to think out of, outside of the box. The, the time for being traditional in terms of searching for solutions uh, is way past. And we can only confront climate change if we innovate. Now, what else, aside from the climate convention, gives us the mandate to uh, pursue these roles? Uh, we have a national law, and uh, I would uh, be happy if uh, I see a show of hands who among you know that we have a national law on climate change. <laughs> but uh, I'm not surprised if uh, people are not aware of this because even in government, uh, about 80% of government employees are not aware that there is a climate change commission. So. But uh, this law, it's, it's a relatively new law. It was passed in 2009. And uh, it established the climate change commission. It also establishes the national framework strategy on climate change and also mandates the commission to formulate uh, the national climate change action plan uh, with the intent of mainstreaming Alam naman po natin, yung word na mainstreaming has always been abused because uh, it's always a big word. Uh, mainstream, mainstreaming of anything now is uh, bound to fail because uh, once you say you want to mainstream something, uh, after several years of implementing a certain mainstreaming effort, uh, we just find out it was not mainstream. Just like gender, uh, just like uh, uh, a lot of other things that we've tried to mainstream in the past. Now, just to give you also an idea of uh, how the Commission uh, works uh, in terms of structure, we have an advisory board composed of cabinet secretaries from various sectors, uh, the League of, uh, the, League of uh, the Government Units, and uh, sector representatives from business, private sector, and academia. And uh, what's more relevant for today is that uh, we have a national panel of technical experts. And I think uh, the role of uh, uh, academic, for instance, is crucial in this national panel. Because uh, as we speak, the Commission is now uh, assembling this panel. And uh, I, I would think that uh, a few weeks from now, we have this national panel of experts uh, on board. And uh, most of them are from academic. Uh, and uh, from, from research institutions. So, yung role po ng, uh, ng sector, ng, ng R&D sector is crucial in ensuring that the Commission is guided accordingly when we, uh, when we formulate policies uh, on climate change. After all, the Commission is the, uh, the sole policy-making body of uh, government on climate change. Um, this is also an eyeful but this is the national framework strategy as we had formulated it uh, early last year. Uh, I wouldn't dwell too much on this except to point uh, to, uh, to the middle where you see the vision of a climate risk resilient Philippines with healthy, safe, prosperous, and self-reliant communities and thriving and productive ecosystems. So that's the vision we have set in terms of confronting climate change. And uh, those uh, the, the, this whole diagram is uh, translated into the action plan, which uh, we have uh, slated to run from 2011 to 2028 to cover three administrations. Um, as I explain uh, the shape of this action plan, I hope you contextualize this also as the uh, as the themes where uh, academic and the R&D sector would play a vital role in, in each and every uh, component that I, that I mentioned. The action plan is uh, geared towards fulfilling the President's social contract with the Filipino people uh, to alleviate poverty, uh, create jobs, and uh, find, the, uh, find the true uh, total value of uh, our natural resources and preserve natural wealth for the benefit of both present and future generations. So, um, just to run, uh, uh, give uh, run, uh, you a list of the guiding principles when we craft this action plan, uh, there is uh, an important emphasis on adaptation, which means 
uh, building resilience for both nat natural and human systems uh, taking into account the impacts of climate change. Uh, a second guiding principle is to derive our actions and plans from um, a combination of scientific uh, scientific uh, evidence and also best practices from communities. So it's not just limited to uh, scientific data but also to uh, indigenous knowledge and also to the experiences of, uh, of uh, people on the ground. It, another principle is uh, the guarantee for protection of the most vulnerable uh, sectors among which are the poor women and children. These are enshrined also in the Climate Change Act. The fourth is the recognition of roles of agencies. The commission is just a coordinated body and we don't intend to implement these plans. We help facilitate in the formulation of the action plans, but it's really the nine agencies and the local governments who will implement the the, the plans as formulated. After all, especially local governments, they are at the forefront of the impacts of uh, climate change. Another uh, fifth principle is that the plan is based on logical and effective actions. Uh, they are not uh, just uh, concepts uh, grasped out of nowhere, but uh, they are logical uh, and effective actions based on uh, the strengths and uh, uh, partnerships among various, uh, various uh, stakeholder groups. Also to give you a context of how this global, since this is uh, more of a public event than a, than a focused uh, group, I, I added a few slides on the global context of on the situation about climate change. As you can see, the 10 warmest years have all been in recent years. And it's always uh, most likely going to be like that. The next decade will be the warmest decade on record, and so on. This is one of my favorite animations, even if we don't have ice in the Philippines. Uh, because this shows uh, one of the dramatic impacts of climate on of climate change, or specifically uh, the Earth's warming on the ice cover in the Arctic. And it has a lot of uh, implications, profound implications globally. So that's a fact. These are actual measurements, and it's going to uh, the, the ice cover there is going to decrease so much more in coming years. Um, this is another favorite image that uh, the commission uses uh, most of the time because uh, when they talk about hurricanes in Florida. Uh, they, they, it seems as if it's a, a hopeless uh, situation, but if you look at the Category 5 typhoons uh, in the past 50 years, most of them are passing through the Philippines. And this is an important context, especially when we talk about rural development and when we talk about food security. So sea level rise is another uh, important context when we talk about climate change. Uh, I'm not going to show you many places, I'm just going to show you at one particular place, my mother's hometown, Pampanga. Um, you know, we have a lot of uh, agricultural production in Central Zone. Uh, that's uh, Manila Bay at the bottom. And uh, we can just uh, imagine how uh, salt water intrusion is going to affect all of uh, uh, those farmlands and uh, uh, fishery areas uh, in Central Luzon. So, it goes without saying that this is a huge challenge for us and uh, that, that demands synergy, that demands uh, thinking outside of the box, as I, as I mentioned earlier. This is another um, illustration of how vulnerable the Philippines is. Uh, and I think it's uh, in, in that orange book there. Um, this, was, this was done by IDRC. And you can see that the Philippines uh, are mostly red compared to the rest of Southeast Asia. And that, 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 that is uh, another reality we have to come to terms with. Now, how warm will it be in terms... Uh, we always... Uh, well, 
we, we, we have the uh, eerie projection about the falling rice yields for every degree Celsius uh, increase in temperature between 10 to 15 percent drop in rice yields. So how far will it be? Uh, this is official government data based on uh, the most probable scenario, uh, which is the globally known as the A2 scenario. Pagasa models 3.4 degrees Celsius warming by 2100. Of course, uh, unless there's a miracle in the medical field, uh, most of us or all of us will no longer be around by 2100. But uh, if we are talking about 3.4 degrees by then, uh, before we get to 2100, uh, we will be experiencing a lot of other uh, drastic situations along the way. And uh, by 2020, in fact, it will be uh, uh, over uh, one degree uh, warming from, from current temperatures. And that's only based on, uh, on Philippine uh, measurements, which started in 1951, and we started measurements. Uh, so in terms of global, uh, relative to global, 3.4 will probably be about 4 degrees warming. And I'll show you what, what that implies when we talk about 4 degrees. Um, this is uh, a map of scenarios for the Philippines. Uh, March, April, May uh, is your summer season. And uh, in the year 2020, uh, let's start with uh, March, April, May. Okay, sorry. Okay, March, April, May is your summer season. So 2020, that's about just nine years from now. You see that uh, most of the Philippines during summer will have no rain. Will have no rain during summer. So only a few places will have uh, will have rain, and uh, but mostly no rain because you need the blue blue shades there for 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 rain, and that spells a lot of trouble for our food security. Uh, by 2050. It's even worse. You have uh, more red areas there. That's during summer. Now, during the rainy season, which is uh, June, July, August, you can see that uh, there's significant increase in rainfall, mostly throughout Luzon and Central Visayas. But look at Southern Mindanao. Even during the rainy season, they won't have rain. So, Southern Mindanao won't have rain the entire year by 2020. By 2050, of course, it's always worse as time goes by. Luzon and Visayas will be very wet during the rainy season, wetter than usual. But look at Southern Mindanao, still no rain. So, I, these are uh, not very fine data, but it, it's an indicator of uh, the challenges we have to confront in the coming years, especially in the agriculture sector. We're looking at rainfall here and, and drought, uh, drought situations. We, we're not even talking about uh, extreme, more ex uh, what you call this, uh, single episode events like very strong typhoons. These are just rainfall patterns. We're, we're not uh, even talking about uh, temperature here. So these are just rainfall. We're not even looking at sea level rise uh, in these scenarios, which will compound the problem. Of so yung sinasabi ko po kanina 4 degrees, which is most likely by 2100. We're now close to 1 degree, and uh, that entails a lot of uh, things, uh, including falling crop yields, water supplies threatened, extensive damage to coral reefs. We know that corals are very sensitive to even slight temperature changes. Intensity of storms are rising, and uh, in the international community, two degrees is considered as a threshold where most of the irreversible changes would take place once it reaches two degrees. But we are in for a four degrees future, and uh, another illustration of what happens when we breach two degrees 
you have exponential increase uh, uh, in, uh, of risk of water shortage, malaria, hunger, and coastal flooding. But we're in for something close to four degrees. Based on the most recent developments, as I said, Copenhagen failed, Cancun failed to save the climate. Based on what we have on the table right now, those proposals are not enough, and we are in for a 40 degrees warmer world. And uh, you've seen the, the graph of that. So for, for the Philippines, we also have to deal with strong typhoons, and we know that uh, uh, our experience with typhoons, for, for instance, on Doi, cost us 2.7% of our GDP in damage to crops, property, and infra. Not to, not to forget the, the numerous deaths and the injuries. So uh, it's a very compelling uh, picture when we talk about damage caused by, by climate change and uh, it's really a serious situation. Uh, storm surge. The Philippines ranks as uh, among the top 10 countries whose economic activity is most at risk from intensification of storm surges. Now this is a, a bit uh, old, but uh, it shows you the top 20 provinces at risk to climate-related disasters. Um, if you look, uh, what's very uh, very alarming in this, uh, but th this is uh, an old uh, map, but you look at this, Metro Manila and Calabar zone, mainly the, the provinces surrounding Metro Manila, where, where we're expanding our urban areas, are very at very high risk to climate related disasters. You have here Albay, Sorsogon, Aspate, and uh, Summer, Stabi uh, But uh, this is uh, uh, old and we are uh, in the process of updating this, so we're really eager to see what's going to happen uh, when we map it out again. But another important uh, map is uh, the top 10 poorest provinces. This is uh, relatively new, 2009 data. Um, and, and if you look at them, uh, uh, at the areas, uh, most of these areas are either mining areas or logging areas. And you wonder why they're still poor. Caraga happens to be the poorest region and the concentration of mining uh, activities there uh, is probably the highest in the country. So in order for us to uh, understand our roles, understand how we confront climate change, it really involves, and uh, this is the context of how we formulate our action plan, it involves transformation. And I will get to that uh, uh, in a more profound level later. The, the National Action Plan is based on this vision. And I've, I've uh, recited that earlier. And the goal is to build adaptive capacity of communities, increase resilience of natural ecosystems, and also optimize the opportunities for mitigation towards, of course, sustainable development. Now, when we talk about uh, agriculture, food security, rural development, we, we have uh, a few key questions like will, will we have enough water to drink? Will we have enough food? Now, the National Climate Change Action Plan looks at all of this and summarizes uh, everything into two objectives. As I said, the has adaptive capacity and we also want to successfully transition into, uh, into green or climate smart development. Now, this is a, a slide that we have not shown publicly, uh, and, it, and you should be uh, privileged to, to see this today, because we are yet to release this uh, publicly, but I, I really wanted to, to show you uh, the components of the plan, so that you have an appreciation of what your government is uh, doing in terms of consolidating the themes and uh, rationalizing how we confront climate change. If you look at these areas, we have deviated from the usual sectoral approach to planning. And what you have in front of you now are themes. 
And when we talk about uh, the role of uh, academia and R&D, especially here in UPLB, uh, food security is very important, a very important component of this plan, and also water sufficiency. But all of those are closely intertwined with each other, and uh, this process has gone through very extensive consultations. Uh, we have had very difficult uh, sessions with, with all stakeholders, difficult but very pleasant consultations, uh, sessions with all stakeholders. And we've arrived at this uh, summary of what we intend to, uh, to pursue in the near future and in the coming decades. So just to, I don't want to explain every detail, but uh, um, for food security, we want availability, but I can go into them. For food security, we're focusing on building more resilient uh, and sustainable uh, food production systems, both uh, um, in uh, land-based agriculture and for fisheries. And not just the, the, the agriculture and fisheries, but also the communities that depend on them. So we want them to be uh, climate resilient. For water, water sufficiency, there are three main uh, components. Of course, water resource management, sustainable supply, and equitable access to water. And uh, this knowledge uh, and capacity development is actually a cross-cutting component, as I will show you later. But it has been highlighted under water, uh, water sufficiency pillar. The third component is uh, ecosystem environmental stability, where we intend to rehabilitate, protect, and restore uh, natural areas in order to um, bring back uh, the, uh, the ecological services that they provide. And that should be uh, beneficial not just for uh, ur urban built areas but also for uh, food security. For the human security component, we have uh, DRRM, climate responsive health and social protection, and adaptive human settlements, and also population management. So we, we made it a point to include all of this uh, in under the human security component in order to achieve our objective of uh, building adaptive communities. For our uh, for our fifth component, climate smart industries and services, we will be promoting eco efficient production. We want to generate or create green jobs and also promote the uh, development of green cities and municipalities. So, if you, when you look at this action plan, it goes beyond incremental climate change solutions, but it goes into the heart of our development paradigm. And I hope that uh, the, the Filipino people appreciate what the Commission has uh, facilitated this process. The sixth component is sustainable energy and uh, we're focusing on energy efficiency and conservation, promotion of renewable energy and uh, I'm personally very excited with uh, environmentally sustainable transport because uh, uh, that's a very low hanging fruit for, for us and uh, our neighbors in Southeast Asia have, uh, are, are now many many miles ahead of us in terms of uh, sustainable transport so we would like to see the Philippines emerge as a as a as a model also for for that. So we're talking about uh, intermodal transport, and uh, it's always a dream for 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 all of us to, to get there uh, to see uh, environmentally sound transportation that's very efficient that can bring you uh, to your destination very fast and uh, in an efficient way. Now, our six, uh, seventh component of the plan is knowledge and capacity development. And, uh, and, I, and I remind you again that when you look at these components, uh, these are the themes where each and every sector, whether you're in academe or you're in, in government or in your in private sector, uh, these are themes that everyone has a role in. And I, I deliberately uh, color this red because this uh, is 
for me, the most important component for the R&D sector. Uh, the Philippines uh, has a very uh, huge challenge in bridging the gap when it comes to knowledge of climate change. We, have, we need a lot of information. Uh, we have a very limited knowledge of how climate change will affect us. The uncertainties are, are out there and we haven't really sorted them out. And it's important for institutions to look at the, uh, the impacts of uh, climate change, not, not just at the national level, but for instance, every barangay, every municipality and city, they need the information to guide them as they plan, uh, as they plan and confront climate change. Uh, that second uh, bullet there, national and local capacity development, uh, is also important because there's, there's uh, about uh, 2 million government employees. It's the biggest employer. Government's the biggest employer. And if we can build capacity among government uh, employees, they will be our climate change workforce. Uh, and uh, most of them are in the rural areas. And it's important for uh, the Commission to ensure that everyone uh, is leveled off in terms of understanding climate change especially in the uh, agriculture sector. And uh, knowledge management is a crucial component, it's a crucial element under this component because uh, information has to be at the fingertips of decision makers, of policy makers. Otherwise, uh, even if you have great research, even if you have uh, uh, very a very good database, for instance, but uh, nobody gets to access them. And uh, in many instances, uh, we have systems for compiling knowledge, but uh, they, they, they're only good for several years. Then, pagkatapos ng uh, ilang taon, then uh, either they, they die a natural death or uh, uh, another tragic thing about uh, knowledge management in the Philippines is that a lot of institutions are doing the same thing. And I think the role of the Commission is to ensure that if someone is doing it, then prevent another institution from duplicating that job. It's a waste of resources. It's a waste of time. It's, it's, it's also uh, not, uh, not helping uh, our chances uh, confront climate change. So those are the seven elements, but we do have uh, also cross-cutting strategies and the usual uh, cross-cutting strategies, IEC, gender mainstreaming, technology, and R&D. Uh, all cross-cutting because for all the seven components, we will have all of these cross-cutting strategies for all of them. But also, aside from cross-cutting, we have means of implementation. We cannot uh, implement this plan without financing uh, and it's it's important for the Commission now to determine total economic value uh, so that uh, we leave resources where we, we should leave them uh, alone. But uh, yeah, we are now uh, embarking on a uh, serious natural resource, national natural resource accounting program under the Climate Change Commission. In principle, this has been uh, approved in the Commission. And uh, another means of implementation Siyempre, kailangan ng multi-stakeholder partnerships and we have to mainstream all of this into the policies and into the planning processes, not just at the national level, but uh, more importantly, at the local level. So, ito po yung illustration lang ng gusto natin gawin na all of our natural resources uh, are assessed in terms of their total value, not just their use value, but uh, their total value. So, umasa po kayo na in the coming months, the coming years, uh, the, the Commission will be very active in determining the actual valuation of our environmental services. So, just to also illustrate the state of our, uh, the, this, is, this is the uh, concrete way of uh, operationalizing the action plan. We are going to select Initially, 238 areas around the country, key biodiversity areas, protect all of those. This is just an illustration. Of course, we also include marine areas. 
protect what, what remains, then um, rehabilitate the buffer zones and uh, also provide areas for sustainable use. Uh, another illustration of uh, the concept that the Commission is trying to promote uh, as a way of operationalizing the action plan is what we call the Echo Towns uh, approach. So we we would select 238 areas of uh, key biodiversity areas and uh, protect uh, protect them and uh, what we have uh, in principle uh, adopted in the Commission is to ban logging in the core areas and to ban mining in all these in all these eco towns, uh, in order to promote uh, the conservation of uh, uh, the, the remaining natural areas, ensure that the watershed is uh, is intact, that can provide for our needs for power, uh, that can also provide for uh, sustainable ecotourism activities, and uh, maximize the, com uh, the competitive advantage of many of our uh, localities. Uh, on the marine side, we will also push for uh, marine protected areas as a way of uh, ensuring that uh, the country is able to adapt to climate change. Also as part of the Ecotown uh, concept. Now, how do we finance our Ecotown uh, projects? Uh, as I said, these are initially 230 uh, areas. They are not municipal or cities, but they are key biodiversity areas. And uh, we are going to uh, make the Philippines a renewable energy manufacturing hub. And uh, we will also be very strong in pushing for uh, the restoration and protection of our natural areas. Those will be our two green growth engines to ensure that uh, the Philippines to uh, the green development path. So, friends, uh, climate change is really not just about the environment, as, as we all uh, appreciate it. It is very much uh, a social, economic, and also a political issue. And in order for us to pursue climate change adaptation, we have to be conscious about pursuing sustainable development. In the end, it's really about uh, sustainable development. Um, I'm, as I said earlier, I'm, I'm glad that we're here together this afternoon because uh, I, I once went to a, to a seminar where there were, there were less than 10 people in the audience. But I always say that uh, that's the beauty of advocacy because if we are going to confront climate change and win this battle against climate change, then it will not be as easy as it, as it sounds. It will take uh, a lot of effort of convincing people. And if I can convince one or two people every day, then that would be enough. Because we are really all here together in a mission. You are not here by accident. Because we need to change the way we look at the future of this country. That's the only way we can survive this challenge. And uh, when we craft the National Action Plan, of course it's not going to end next week, which is our legal deadline. Uh, it is really a trailblazing endeavor. Uh, a few countries have embarked on such uh, such a mission to craft their own action plans. It's it's really a handful of countries, and we're one of the first to do this. So, ito pong paggawa natin ng national action plan is uh, something that we did without a template because uh, uh, we could not uh, copy from any model. Uh, after all. Uh, it's a unique uh, situation for any country. Now, I, I, I love quotations and uh, I will never uh, finish uh, a talk without a quotation. So, um, this, uh, this one from Winston Churchill exemplifies the attitude of uh, many of the countries responsible for uh, this problem called climate change. And uh, they pretend they pretend that nothing's wrong. They pretend that they can watch TV again and just pretend that there's a magic key. Another quote from uh, Chomsky. Um, they're looking for a magic key in solving climate change. That's why you have to be very 
um, cautious about things like uh, carbon credits, for instance. Because uh, they're trying to find that magic key to solve this. But there's no magic key. And I invite you to, to read this uh, paragraph. But if you can understand this, then may pag-asa pa tayo. Kasi kahit na mong sanayata ang Pilipino sa text language, eh, pero uh, if, if we can understand this statement, even if it's a uh, jumbled letters, then uh, I think uh, climate change is not that uh, hard to understand. But uh, this is actually based on this. Siyempre, nakuha, nakuha ko po yan sa mga kumakalat na yung pili. But truly, this is, uh, it's really amazing how, how the human mind works. And uh, uh, this is another example, a uh, visioning image we use when we, we do visioning exercises. Uh, what do you see, di ba? Uh, it, the, mind is, the human mind is really powerful. And I'll go to my point uh, right away after this. Uh, you can see different images and you can shift from one to another. But if you ask uh, a five-year-old kid to look at this, it will be two Because uh, our, the way we process things, uh, in the next slide, actually it's not six but nine dolphins. So some of you must have seen this in, in your emails before, but uh, do you see the nine dolphins? But aside from the nine dolphins, you see something else. Because how we process process things is based on our experience. Hindi uh, yung experience na inisip niya. Based on experience, and a young, a young child wouldn't, uh, would only see the nine dolphins. Because uh, what, how you process things is based on the inputs that you get throughout your life. And uh, that's how the human mind works. In fact, the human mind is the basis, the model for Google. Of course, all of you use Google. Uh, and Google is such a powerful engine. It's a powerful tool. But it falls way, way short of the human brain. It, 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 it doesn't even come close to the human brain. But, it, but we love Google and we're very impressed. My point about this set of images is that innovation cannot be done by computers, not by cell phones, not by uh, gadgets, but by the human mind. And uh, it's important for us to always uh, understand that inputs, experiences are important when we innovate. And uh, we can only uh, arrive at uh, uh, a, an effective solution to a problem such as climate change if we continue to uh, uh, to appreciate not just the that not just information that we have in front of us, but information that we get from the grassroots, information that we get from communities, because the solutions are really not out there, not far away, but in our hands. There's always the misconception that when we confront this problem, we need technology support from the rich countries. We need, uh, we need uh, their mighty inventions to help us. But no, most of the things that we need to confront climate change are in our hands. Uh, we can make uh, our food production more sustainable. And uh, we are blessed with a lot of natural wealth in, in this country. And uh, we have to be really thankful for that. We are also blessed with great people. So uh, I think that's also the context of how we should 
see our roles. Uh, we have uh, a lot of abundant renewable resources that we can tap to, to confront this, this, this problem. And as we now I actually come to the last part of my presentation, but as we come to reflect on this problem and how we appreciate the role of uh, specifically the academe and the research and development sector, we have to go beyond uh, we have to go beyond the uh, natural science of it, but also look at it at uh, the perspective of human behavior. So I think there's a very important role in in transforming human behavior. <coughs> and interestingly, in the IPCC report, it, they said that human behavior is the least understood element of the climate system. But the but human behavior is the primary primary cause of uh, the climate change problem. Now, uh, some this uh, this is not a comprehensive list of recommendations, but I would urge the sector to prioritize uh, a deeper understanding of the impacts of climate change, especially at the grassroots level, the, at the community level, where they really need guidance on uh, assessing vulnerability, assessing risk. It's also important for the sector to both focus, not just to focus on immediate solutions, but also on long-term strategies. Uh, comprehensive education is something that's a, that's a big task that we have to work on together. And uh, technology, not, 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 not high-tech or, or whatever, but techno appropriate technology for, for uh, the challenges that are uh, in front of us. Some of the important things that we need to focus on when we reflect on this problem, that the Commission pushes for resource valuation. This is really important for us. Uh, if we know the real value of uh, natural resources, then we know what to do with them. We know um, uh, what not to do with them as well. So uh, we also push for deeper understanding of indigenous knowledge, appropriate technologies. Early warning systems is really important uh, in uh, determining, uh, in, in, in confronting climate change uh, and disasters. Um, also localized climate forecasting for that matter. That, that's very useful for, for farmers and fisher folks. Uh, ito po yung isa sa mga uh, priority ng uh, administration is land use planning. Uh, and uh, there, there's really a, a snowballing of uh, support for a national land use act. Uh, and uh, I, would, I would just be very disappointed if Congress doesn't respond to the, to the call for, after all your land use National Land Use Act would be the basis for all planning, and uh, if we don't have that, then it will be difficult to implement this climate change action. And uh, financing is also a key theme when we talk about climate change because uh, um, there are a broad range of issues related to financing, and after all, it's uh, an important element in implementing all of this. So, as I said earlier, um, convincing people to confront climate change and to appreciate this problem for what it really is entails a lot of uh, sometimes uh, numbing work, uh, but you have to just continue doing it, try to convince people every day, build a better organization. Sometimes you will experience frustration and uh, you will uh, you will uh, feel that there's no hope, but you will eventually get somewhere. So this is not unique to uh, confronting climate change. This is what we've done in our social policy advocacy over the last few decades. This is what has transformed uh, the, the landscape in Philippine, uh, in Philippine politics, for instance. And uh, it's important for us to continue doing uh, social policy advocacy. And uh, I, I think there's a very big role for researchers, a, a very big role for uh, uh, PhD uh, graduates, a very big role for uh, academicians to continue social policy advocacy, no matter what field you are in. 
after all, uh, the struggle against climate change is uh, supposed to be part of a larger context, which is a pursuing a just democratic and equitable world. Because this is an equity issue. Uh, climate change is not uh, something that the Philippines caused, but we are at the receiving end of its impacts. So, may panahon pa naman po, but uh, we really have to, to act now. Uh, it, this brings me uh, to some of uh, my metaphors as I end my presentation. Um, RSI is the fastest growing occupational health hazard today. And uh, RSI is caused by the use of the keyboard. This is called the QWERTY keyboard, uh, the, the keyboard that we all grown fond of, uh, I want you to uh, to bear with me for a while and medyo hindi ako ng audience participation. Uh, just try to do it on your, since you have tables in front of you. Um, so ito po yung keyboard that causes RSI. RSI is repetitive strain injury and uh, it's the fastest growing. So just try to tap your fingers in sequence from the smallest to uh, the pointer finger. Okay? Just imagine you're playing the piano or pushing the piece on your keyboard. And uh, try doing it the other way from the pointer to the pinky. Ano po mas madali? Yung una. Based on that principle, Dr. Deborah invented this layout. So, sino po dito sa pato na ito yung gumagamit itong keyboard na ito? Wala po, di ba? But, but he invented this. Well, the QWERTY keyboard was invented in 1860. <coughs> dahil nga natitipit yung mga keys ng typewriter dahil alphabetical yung unang uh, layout ng keyboard. So, ginawa nilang QWERTY para hindi magtikit-tikit. Because most of the words in the English language, siya pala of words na magkakasunod alphabetically. Bawa, uh, the word about, about, the field, so A, B, tapos D, marami pong ganon. So they, they, they invented the word D. But Dr. Tibora invented this in 1936 to prevent RSI. And the fastest type is on earth, 212 words per minute, uses this keyboard. So problema ko, wala akong kilalang gumagamit ng keyboard nito. That's why we have a lot of cases of RSI. My point really is solving climate change uh, requires us to embrace change. The reason why we don't use these keyboards is because we've just gone used to using this keyboard and uh, nobody cared to really use the new keyboard. Now, when we rise to the challenge, uh, this is a picture I took with my cell phone. Uh, sa Pilipinas lang, hindi naman nakakita ng traffic light na may nakapaskil nakalagay na stop when the light is red o tuminto kung wala ang ila and uh, this is really I mean for some it's funny for some it's uh, uh, disappointing I don't know but uh, I've been to many places but uh, sa Pilipinas nga talaga may ganyan and uh, you have to explain what the traffic light means um, and climate change is a universal sign as well just like the spotlight, it's a universal sign that any citizen on earth can recognize. Kahit po sa bansa tayo pumunta, alam mo na yung sabihin ng red light. But uh, here in the Philippines, we need a, a sign to tell us what it is. Uh, so if I'm asking, can we rise to the challenge, we need to change the way we, we do things. Hindi pwede may, may, may poster nakalagay dyan, climate change will affect you. Because climate change is a universal sign and we need to recognize it for what it is. We don't need a sign to tell us what it is. And therefore, confronting climate change means building a better nation. There's really no choice for us but to eliminate corruption. Sabi nga nila, yung highway eh, magka ginawa mong walang corruption eh, climate proof na yung highway mo. But uh, of course, that's being simplistic. But we need to change the way governance is, is done in this country. We have no choice. We, we need to 
follow our climate change action plan, otherwise we won't survive this. And uh, it gives us comfort to know that even if uh, there are only a few of us who are crazy enough uh, to go against the tide, uh, in fact, the, the, the people who are crazy enough make the difference. And uh, pasensya na kayo marami akong quotation kasi ayaw kong ma ayaw kong ma-accuse ng plagiarism. So, no power on earth can stop an idea whose time has come. And uh, I think uh, it's clear to everyone that uh, to ensure food security, water sufficiency, human security, all of these things, they're, they're really no-brainer. Pursuing renewable energy, for instance, uh, sustainable agriculture, um, developing drought-resistant varieties. These are ideas whose time has come. And uh, there's really no question about pursuing them. And just to stress, no single organization can do it alone. Why? Because this is war, and more people die because of climate change than bullets. So, the, my final question is, can we really win this battle for survival? There's really no question about that. Of course, we can. Magandang hapag po sa inyong lahat. Thank you very much, Ms. Lirisanyo. At this point, I would like to invite our audience to ask uh, your questions or direct your questions or comments to Commissioner Sanyo. Before I do so, um, can I request everyone to speak in English for the benefit of our international uh, uh, participants here and also to introduce yourself and uh, your organization. Uh, and uh, since I know that many of you would like to ask questions to manage the time, can we please uh, get straight to the point so that we can uh, ask more people to ask questions? Yes, ma'am, you're the first one I saw. Good afternoon, sir. I'm Dora Fabernardo. I am a graduate student of Environmental Science and Management. And um, thank you for a number of information and ideas. As far as I remember, one of our professors who is a part of the IPCC mentioned, I think last year, that the Commission has 50 million budget. So I'm interested to know, if you don't mind, how would you allocate this one with, with those several priority areas? And if you have already specific and perhaps uh, participatory-based projects that have been materialized, or if not, when is the target for this um, plan? Thank you. Um, actually, the 50 million ang budget namin. Our, our budget is not 50 million, it's 38 million only for this year. Uh, but uh, the Commission is a coordinated body and uh, we don't implement uh, projects, we don't implement initiatives, we facilitate uh, the implementation, especially if it's thematic, across agencies. And our role is to ensure that it's coordinated, that uh, agencies don't duplicate the work of other agencies, that uh, resources are uh, flowing from where they, they should flow towards where they're needed. So um, we don't really need a big budget to do that. We just need uh, a modest budget to, to do our work. After all, we only have about 30 people in our office. So, uh, but but the, the important thing is where we we would get the money. Uh, first, the GAA should be a climate change budget. The whole GAA, whether you're talking about public works, health, education, you're talking about environment, uh, agriculture, um, tourism. All of those budgets of all agencies should be climate sensitive. And that will, will help us implement this plan. We also have a host of other uh, financing uh, schemes that will uh, pour money into implementing this plan. We have uh, yeah, in our minds creating, as I said, uh, the, the green growth engine. So we intend to uh, make the Philippines the hub of renewable energy manufacturing. We want to protect, as I said, the eco towns so that uh, we have the comparative advantage of uh, for sustainable tourism that will generate jobs uh, and uh, ensure uh, that uh, the local economies uh, are thriving uh, 
of course, these are concepts that, that can be very good theoretically, but uh, we are really uh, keen on starting the, the pilot project so that we, we, we would know if they will really work. We're also looking at them for nature swaps. Uh, for us to, uh, in, instead of paying our debts, then uh, translate them into projects that will uh, benefit our, uh, our local communities. We're, we're, we're looking also at uh, the windows available under the, the UN uh, FCCC. There are a number of windows. In fact, last December, uh, we, we established the group, uh, Green Climate Fund, and we intend to tap these funds. Uh, right now, it's under uh, the process of being designed, and uh, the Philippines, uh, I'm, I'm proud to tell you, was, was able to make it into the transitional committee that will design the Green Climate Fund, so we, we have a hand in uh, making sure that the Philippines uh, will be able to access uh, those funds. So there are a lot of uh, also windows for funding from our traditional development partners. Uh, if you notice, most of the eight agencies are now uh, labeling their um, financing flows as climate change financing. So. Uh, we, we feel that there is a lot of uh, opportunity out there uh, that the Commission thinks that climate change can be translated into opportunities and uh, we are just keen on making that happen. We're not very worried about our own budget uh, but uh, we, we think there is enough money out there. Any more questions from our audience? Dr. Bernardo? This is uh, Nandim Bernardo. Uh, I'm very much impressed by your presentation. It's so comprehensive uh, and uh, very important, extremely important. <coughs> I want to talk about uh, the two important areas, climate adaptation, climate mitigation, because I think uh, you did not make that very clear. <coughs> Uh, but you, you, men you mentioned a few, but they're not categorized as climate adaptation and climate mitigation. Uh, this is, it's important to, to differentiate uh, the two because, uh, as you said, many of us will be involved. <clears throat> many agencies will be involved. Some, uh, most especially universities and research centers, will be uh, greatly involved, for in instance, in adaptation. <laughs> and uh, uh, for instance, I, I come from Erie, uh, and uh, Erie has been uh, developing uh, a lot of uh, rice uh, varieties that are adapted to uh, climate change, like uh, flooding. Huh? Because our varieties, when flooded for uh, for many days uh, could be destroyed, but uh, we have now varieties that can adapt to flooding. Uh, after uh, uh, two weeks, three weeks, uh, depending on the stage of growth of the plant, they can still grow and uh, give high yields. Uh, we are developing varieties that are resistant to drought, <coughs> which is very important. Uh, and this is also important. Varieties with resistance to salinity, to salt, because climate change is going to really affect a lot of our agricultural areas. You showed it that you know, the many areas, agricultural areas, will be uh, uh, inundated or enriched by saline now, waters or salty waters, and our rice should be able to survive on, on salty uh, areas, salty water uh, or uh, soil. <clears throat> One important thing is that climate change uh, will affect uh, <clears throat> temperature and uh, as shown in Ely, one degree uh, increase in temperature could reduce yield by about 15 percent. Uh, fortunately, we found a variety that has resistance to uh, Heat stress, in other words, high temperature, high give high yields in spite of the high temperatures. 
But this brings me to a very important point. Uh, IRI is doing a lot of uh, research work for adaptation. Phil Rice is supposed to be a partner of IRI doing research in, in collaboration with IRI. But the budget of Phil Rice was drastic, drastically reduced from 400 million to 91 million. Uh, so, uh, why does, uh, what has to be done uh, to convince our uh, politicians uh, that there are key uh, areas that are really very important in climate change, adaptation to climate change, that really should be funded continuously. <laughs> Uh, that means uh, information uh, dissemination. But you know, if you present something like this to most people, printed or uh, verbally, uh, many will not listen. Uh, we are here listening because we are interested. <laughs> uh, you have to make sure that you, there is a short presentation that focuses on the more important things for the politicians. Because you cannot hold the, uh, the interest of politicians if, if it's a bit, a bit complicated. It has to be a more focused, short, convincing presentation to politicians for them to be uh, convinced that these are important. Otherwise, uh, uh, they're not going to make the right decisions for financing. And that is where I think you can your commission can help different agencies, universities, research centers, or whichever. Uh, but there are too many things to be done, so they have to be prioritized, and your your commission can help uh, so that at least for the areas that are high priority, government can focus resources. <clears throat> and the other thing is on mitigation, uh, uh, because. As you said, the temperature will increase 3.5% uh, <clears throat> in the next uh, uh, 90, 90 years. <clears throat> so we, can, we should talk about mitigation. How, how do we prevent that? How can we contribute to, to the world, at least to our country? Huh? Uh, but this is a world problem, you know. Uh, what should be done? Uh, uh, the Philippines is, of course, contributing very little to climate change. But it's large countries, highly industrial countries that are contributing a lot to climate change. And the, uh, these are the countries that should really take the leadership to mitigate uh, climate change. But it doesn't mean we don't have a role. We have a lot of... Uh, uh, role also. Uh, as you can see, uh, in the Philippines, most of our uh, vehicles uh, are, uh, you know, belching a lot of smoke contributing to climate change. Uh, even all, all the vehicles are being run, uh, which are not efficient, and belching a lot of smoke contributing to climate change. What should the government do? Uh, this is just an example. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bernardo. Um, uh, on your first point, uh, I deliberately, well, the Commission is deliberately moving away from the dichotomy between adaptation and mitigation. Why? Because we feel that mitigation is not something that's uh, the responsibility of the Philippines. We will do mitigation actions in the context of sustainable development, meaning these are also adaptation actions to build our resilience, to uh, to win us away from uh, oil imports, for instance. So it is a function, really, of adaptation. Uh, but in the global context, of course, it's categorized as mitigation actions, especially those that uh, deal with uh, energy and uh, transport. Um, but uh, this is our national framework strategy on which the action plan is based on. Uh, the, the, the delineation between mitigation adaptation is very clear. But uh, if you look at it uh, closely, the, the box of mitigation is inside the box of adaptation because we treat mitigation as a function of adaptation. Um, but I agree with you that uh, even if we don't uh, contribute significantly to the global emissions, uh, we, have, uh, we practically have no historical responsibility. 
it is a global problem that requires a global solution and uh, um, we have to maximize or optimize the mitigation opportunities for the Philippines, especially if they will uh, redound to sustainable development for us and they will uh, redound to uh, uh, social well-being. Uh, for instance, yung COVID, the COVID benefits include uh, cleaner air, uh, probably lower, uh, cheaper power rates and cheaper transport uh, uh, costs. So, uh, these are things that we really have to, to look at. Uh, we also deliberately are avoiding uh, lumping agriculture into the mitigation discussion. Because as a developing country, we do not want to constrain our food production. And if we have uh, methane emissions from agriculture, we don't want to, well, we can talk about it, but we don't want to constrain the Philippines uh, in that sector. So we will deal with power sector, transport sector, uh, even uh, waste emissions, but uh, we, it's a very delicate line uh, we're, we're treading on, a delicate ground we're treading on when we talk about food production because, uh, but as much as we want to, uh, as much as we can, we will push for sustainable agriculture or if, if we, a lot of sectors are calling for uh, a shift to uh, broader adoption of organic agriculture for instance but uh, these are these are nuances and uh, as, a, as a matter of policy we will not constrain uh, the agriculture sector in terms of emissions because that can be uh, disastrous for our food security objectives uh, on the other uh, point uh, i'm really glad i'm not a politician but uh, i also agree with you that's why in my presentation if you remember there are portions that are uh, animated and uh, cartoons that's meant for politicians. The, the, the complicated graphs are meant for people like you. But uh, seriously, uh, yes, it, it, it's a big challenge, but uh, I am also glad to tell you that uh, the, the Climate Change Commission will be uh, on board all of the budget hearings because uh, our allies in Congress and in the Senate uh, want, us, uh, want the Commission uh, to uh, be, be, be there to influence the budgets of each agency uh, so that it will become time responsive. We're also closely working with Secretary Abad uh, of the DBM uh, because he wants uh, the whole national budget to be climate sensitive and I think that's a good sign. Um, and uh, if, if uh, more politicians will, will appreciate uh, this issue then I think uh, uh, we're gaining good ground. <laughs>